big boss that's special It ain't no game, but they say I'm welcome to the second level Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. It's my pleasure to introduce Francesca Carlotta Leone, who's going to be doing a talk on game design. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. There's a, there's, there's a lot of people here. Um, thanks, for, thanks for coming out. I hope you're having a really good time. Um, I literally, like everyone who asked me, I can't stop talking about how awesome this event is and how nice everyone is that I've, I've met here so far. Um, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to be doing a short uh, little presentation just about um, game design. So just as a disclaimer, this is more of like an entry level um, like presentation for game design. So if you're a very experienced game designer, this might be a little back to the basics for you. Um, but I think we could all use that sometimes as well. Um, so just jumping right in, if my clicker works, maybe, am I not supposed to hit the arrow? There it is, thank you. Um, so just a little bit about me, um, so you know who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, so I am Francesca, you can find me on the internet there. Um, so I am, I'm pretty young and I have had the unique experience of going to um, both an undergraduate, specifically in game development, as well as um, now I'm doing a master's in game design um, at the NYU Game Center. Um, so some of the things that I do um, over here, I do a podcast called Indie Complete. Um, it's kind of like a book club for indie games. So we pick one game every month, um, play it, and then talk about it. Um, I also work with Girls Make Games. We are an organization that runs um, summer camps and workshops for middle school aged girls, um, teaching them about code theory and game development. Um, yeah, so you can check us out online. Um, and I'm here today representing um, Contigo Games, which is a um, independent game studio that I co-founded. Um, and we are showing our game Starcrossed in, um, <laughs> in the um, expo hall right now. Um, and this is my dog, Olive. My clicker, my clicker is not working. Am I supposed to not hit the arrow? The right arrow. I am hitting the right arrow. OK. OK, I'll keep talking. Um, so yeah, so um, so this is our game Starcross that we're showing. It's a two-player cooperative game about magical girls in space. Um, and then this is the other game that I'm demoing, a tabletop game. Um, it's a social narrative card game about concocting a cover-up to excuse yourself from a murder. Um, <laughs> very different uh, aesthetics going on here. Um, next slide, if possible. Thank you so much, by the way. I really appreciate it. No! It's a disaster. OK, great. Thank you. That's fine. Um, so I'll keep talking. So um, let's talk a little bit about like what is a game designer? Like, What is your job on the team? What do you do? Um, so game designer, thank you so much. Thank You're a superhero. All right. Um, so uh, pulling, pulling a quick little quote. So design, if we think of design as the creation of a plan, for the construction of an object system or human interaction, um, considering like the aesthetics and the function of the thing that you are designing. Um, so within that, when we talk about that in relationship to games, um, a lot of people don't realize that there's lot, lots of, there's like so many things that actually need to be designed in a game. Um, so we have all these sort of like sub sections of designers. So we have level designers who are primarily designing like spaces, physical spaces, and how the player is going to navigate that space. Um, we also have UI and UX designers. That's user interface and user experience. Um, so when you think about like health bars, that's user interface. That's a lot of the um, like information that is player facing that you need to communicate and you're designing that communication. Um, whew. We also have Content designers. So content designers are more, um, if you think like w like all of the content that is going in your game, if you're thinking like quest design. Um, quest, there are people who just do like quest design for World of Warcraft and that is a huge, huge job. Um, we also have like narrative designers who are designing how the narrative of the story is gonna play out. Um, system designers, combat designers, the list goes on and on and on. There's, there's so many subsections. So if you're interested more in like designing physical spaces, you might wanna be a level designer if you're interested in constructing enticing stories and figuring out like plot twists and things, you might be more of a narrative designer. 
There it goes, thank you. <laughs> um, so if you are interested in becoming a designer, here are some of the things that I think are most valuable skills. So if you like these things, you might be a good game designer. Um, being able to communicate your ideas effectively. In general, I think the number one skill to have in game development in general, but especially for designers, is being able to communicate effectively with other people um, in a positive way. Um, so be nice to everybody. Uh, uh, also collaborating with others, so playing well with others, being able to accept feedback, um, which is also on that list, um, and being able to um, understand where people are coming from and the different perspectives that they might have and how that might benefit your design. Um, so also accepting that feedback, sometimes it's hard to hear when people think something that we made and we love should be a little bit different. Um, but being able to adapt um, and being able to like keep in mind that goal of providing a player with the optimal experience that they can have. Um, so ultimately that's, that's your goal and you should be comfortable adapting your designs and your ideas to accommodate that end goal. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about um, that initial goal that is like a good place to start, um, we can think about the experiential goals that we want our player to have. So that's sort of like, what is the player taking away from this experience? Um, how are they going to feel when they play your game? What are they going to accomplish? Um, so when we talk about experiential goals, um, you should be thinking about that as you go into designing a game. Like what is that overall um, moment or, um, yeah, just like, big idea that you want your players to take away from your game. Click. High five. Okay, so you have your experiential goal, and now we're gonna go into more of the process of actually uh, making your game. Awesome, so let's start talking a little bit about um, gameplay loops. So a gameplay loop is um, the main activities that your player is going to be engaging with over and over and over again as they play your game. Um, so here is the gameplay loop for Jenga. Um, pull out a block and put it on top of the tower. Did the tower fall over? No, it loops back over. Uh, if it did fall over, then the game is over. So this is a, a, an idea of a very basic loop where you're doing this action over and over again, um, and by doing it, it creates an enticing gameplay. Um, you can, you can analyze pretty much any game and think about the patterns of activities that you're going through, whether it be a way that you're um, leveling up. Um, if we think about Pokemon, it can even be like navigating to a new city, right? So you're, um, you're like going on a route, you're encountering new Pokemon, you're training new Pokemon, and then you get to the city and there's like sort of like that boss fight, the gym battle, right? So that's a pattern that you're going through over and over throughout the game. And within that gameplay loop, we have smaller gameplay loops of like, what does, a, what does a Pokemon battle look like? That's a loop that you're going through over and over again. But it's well designed so it doesn't feel tedious and it, it feels like something that you're, you're making progress and it's something that um, is enticing as gameplay. So when you're designing a gameplay loop, um, it's exciting, or sorry, one second. It is important um, to keep in mind that you need to communicate a clear goal for your players. Um, and also keep that goal simple. Um, if you have a quest that, you know, it should, be, it should be a loop and players should know what their end goal is going to be, uh, but you make it very, very complicated and there's like too many loops and loops and loops, then um, they might lose sight of what that goal is and they might lose that motivation. Um, and keep in mind always that experiential goal as you're doing that. So the next thing to think about when you're actually going into designing um, your gameplay and the interactions that your player um, is going to have with this game, um, we can start thinking about um, difficulty curves. And um, I also wanna mention that this isn't for most games. Um, some games aren't meant to be difficult. They're meant to be small, um, small experiences that are very like pleasant and chill, and that's totally okay too. Um, but when I, when I talk about um, like difficulty curves, these are games that maybe like you're going through levels, if we think of even like a lot of mobile games. Um, what is the difficulty curve that is going to keep players engaged and challenged, but also not challenge them so much that they're going to lose interest and stop playing and get frustrated? So if we think about it, sort of like there's um, challenge versus their mastery of skill and understanding. So this is an example of like, a direct curve. Most games don't follow this because it's actually quite quite boring if it's this perfect line. Um, but on our next slide, 
we have some examples. Um, so over here we can see, um, here is sort of an example of like a game that is reliant on um, boss fights in breaking up the pattern. So we sort of have this gradual increase in difficulty um, that is keeping players engaged, but we also have this spike of difficulty with boss fights where it provides that extra challenge that they can overcome. Um, and here's an example of like where your player might uh, like lose interest or leave your game. Um, so at the bottom, we sort of have high performance players um, who are mastering to, like they're mastering the skills very quickly, um, but the challenge is not increasing quickly enough for them to stay interested. So eventually they might lose interest and stop playing because they're missing that sense of challenge and accomplishment. Um, and the red line is a frustrated player, a player who needs a little bit um, or is taking a little bit longer to master the skills needed, um, but you're providing a more, um, a more challenging difficulty curve, and so they might get frustrated and give up. Um, so just something to keep in mind if you think about the patterns and these loops that they're going through, is it a boss fight where you're spiking challenge a little bit, and then going back to something where they feel a little more comfortable, and breaking up that pattern so that players stay engaged. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the process of design and game development. Um, so you make an idea, you make a game, you show people the game, and then profit. It's amazing, right? It doesn't actually um, work like that. If you could click really quick, I have a cute dog picture. So this is what you look like when you start designing a game. Um, you're like, wow, I have this amazing idea and it's so good. And then this is what it actually kind of looks like, the process. Um, <laughs> uh, you you kind of stop looking like that happy corgi. Um, so when I think about sort of like my process and the steps I go through when, when I design something and when I actually build it, um, so there's lots and lots of brainstorming, lots of brainstorming. Um, and then uh, usually I'll do something called like a physical prototype. Even if I'm building a digital game, I'll build some sort of like pen and paper prototypes showing the mechanics just so I can test it with people and see if those loops that I'm designing are actually engaging. Um, and then you play test. And then you make a digital prototype. And then you play test some more. Um, and then you're maybe going to do some design documentation once you've kind of nailed what your idea actually is and what's working and what's not working. Um, then you start making the thing, and then you play test, and then you fix the thing, and then you repeat steps eight and nine um, for a really, really long time, and then eventually you will ship that game. Um, so please click, there's another Corgi picture. So then you start looking like this Corgi, um, who's a little frazzled and like, wow, this is a lot bigger than I initially thought this idea was. Um, click one more, there's also a cat picture. So like here's, <laughs> and this is all your teammates who are just like, whoa, okay, like what are we doing? Where are we going with this? Um, but it's very rewarding when you, when you get to the end of, of this process. Um, so talking a little bit about um, paper prototypes, here are just some examples of just like, it doesn't have to be pretty. Um, it, you don't have to spend a lot of time on like graphic design or whatever. This is just, this is the most basic form of your game and its mechanics so that you're able to just get it on a table, get it in front of people, see if it's fun, see if people like it, see if they're like, man, this is kind of boring. Um, and you might be thinking that like, oh, but like once it's digital, it'll be so much more appealing, it'll be so much better. Um, usually if your mechanic is like really bombing at this point of the development phase, you might want to consider making some changes before you go into that digital prototype phase. Um, so the, the big idea that I'm kind of getting at is um, iterative design. So doing a lot of playtesting, making a lot of changes, and making so many iterations of your game that you like lose count of how many versions there are. Um, and each iteration is gonna get better and better through playtesting. The next slide, please. Thank you. So playtesting is when you take your game and you put it in front of people. Um, usually in the beginning this will be friends, um, and then you'll come to Pixel Pop and show your game to everybody here. Um, so here are some friends playing a game and you're the cat in the middle, playtesting and observing and taking a lot of notes about everything, about how they're engaging with your game, how they are acting, are they engaged, are they on their phones, um, are they confused about certain mechanics, have you made things overly complicated, are things overly simple so that they're not challenging. Um, these are all things to notice. So. Um, some of the best practices for playtesting is just like early and often. So as I said, like doing paper prototypes where you can get that very, very bare bones design out and in front of people. Um, that's great. 
uh, because failure means that you're learning. If something is broken and you're able to reflect upon it and fix it, um, that is great. You're learning, you're improving your game. Um, also failing earlier, especially when you're working on um, like digital prototypes, um, especially if you're at a company, um, the longer you wait to make those changes, the more expensive and difficult they're gonna make, they're gonna be to make later down the road. Um, so know who you're designing for. This is sort of figuring out your target audience and what they're looking for in a game and you can design with sort of those people in mind to make a good experience for them. Um, as I said earlier, like take notes all the time. Always have a notebook, always be observing how people are interacting with the systems you've designed. I don't know why I'm turning around, there's a TV in front of me. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, yeah, so excited. Um, and just uh, another really important thing for playtesting is actually making sure that players feel comfortable in the space where they are playing your game. Five minutes, thank you. Um, so making sure they're comfortable expressing their thoughts, um, making sure that they know they're not gonna hurt your feelings if, you, if they express a, an opinion that like something isn't really working for them. Just making a safe space where they are able to express those opinions, which you can then take as feedback and improve your game. So you actually want people to tell you when they're not really feeling something. Um, and you wanna see the game through their eyes. Um, be comfortable throwing things away. So um, for every, uh, this is something that a professor told me my very first like game design class I ever took. Um, he said, every 10 games you make, one of them will be good. Well, he actually said one of them might be good. Um, <laughs> which was a little bit scary, like going into making my first game. Um, and then he said, every 10 good games you make, one of them might be great. Um, so it's this idea of just like making as many prototypes and ideas as you can, and then really finding those gems and being able to like know which ones are the ideas that you should be pursuing. Um, so thinking about like why is this, when you're thinking about like mechanics within a project, so why is this element of the game important? Does it fulfill your initial experiential goal for the player? Um, and it's okay to throw away ideas, like that's something I still really struggle with. Um, like throwing away an idea because it doesn't really fit what I'm trying to achieve with this game. And something that's helped me is actually taking those pieces that I throw out and recycling them into future projects. So finding a place that they're a little better suited for. Um, and I definitely recommend keeping a notebook. Here's some more dogs playing games because I found so many when I was looking for playtesting pictures. <laughs> and they're really cute. Um, to leave off, I wanted to give a couple resources. Um, if you're interested in learning more about a game designer type role and also um, other roles in the industry, um, my friend Lucy has these really great uh, like game dev role cheat sheets that she has created. Um, so they all kind of outline sort of like your, your roles within your team, what skills are really important to have, and I definitely recommend checking that out if you're not sure where exactly your skill set might fit in in a game development team. Um, yeah, and then here's some other resources. Um, some of the things that I, I quoted in the presentation, some books I really recommend um, checking out that are really good as both like a primer for game design uh, practice, but also get really into like the nitty gritty of like play testing and like how to design a really satisfying experience for players. Um, yeah, so that's that's all I have for you. Um, and I wanted to do, I think we have maybe like three, two, three minutes for a couple questions, if anybody has some questions. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, if anybody has questions. I was talking super, super fast because I was like, I only have 20 minutes. Yeah. Previous slide, please. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, I really recommend checking these out. They're very, like, they're very good about sort of like outlining um, what skills you need and um, sort of like how you're gonna be working on a, on a bigger team. Um, but then again, there are a lot of like single person teams where you're doing design and everything else. And this is also good to kind of know like what the different roles um, are. Yeah. Well, I would recommend going to the internet mm -hmm. to Yeah, yeah, so, um, so just to repeat the question, is sort of like if you're a designer or a writer uh, participating in game jam teams, um, for people who don't know, game jams are um, a designated period of time where a lot of people get together and they make a game usually around a theme. Thank you. Um, 
So I would, I would disagree that like designers and writers like aren't helpful during game jam experiences, but I really do think you have to find a team that is gonna work with you and bring your skills into whatever they're making um, because there is like a time limit and there's so much just like, you, there's so little design time and so much just like we have to build, we're building something, we're building something the whole weekend. It becomes really difficult for you to really do a lot of like play testing and do a lot of iterative design. Um, and that is that is really difficult, but I do think that um, if you have strong design skills, the game design, the game jam experience becomes a lot more positive, and what you end up making becomes a lot more coherent. So I would definitely say that, um, like, if you are a designer, maybe picking up a couple other skills to bring into that space to work with a team, um, or if you are an artist or a programmer, like picking up a couple game design skills so that you can bring that when you're working on small teams in game jam experiences. And I highly recommend doing game jams, they're really fun. Um, unfortunately, time is up, but I'm gonna be hanging out, so please come chat with me and we can talk for a bit. Thank you so much, everyone. It ain't no game, but they say I'm welcome to the second level.